Welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Robles, and this episode is brought to you by Amazon Pharmacy, Every Plate, Upstart, and Nebbia. You'll hear about those in a moment. And joining me this week on this historic Apple Insider episode where we're actually looking each other in the eye or in the webcam is both my friend across the pond, William Gallagher. Well, I don't know why I couldn't say your name then. William Gallagher, how you doing? Uh, were you just so choked up? That's so incredibly ro- roguishly handsome. <laughs> That's right. I am. Is that, is that what did it work with me? Nobody else is going to check. You're dashing good looks. They're just a distraction now. It's a burden. Yeah, as are the good looks of Neil Hughes also on this week. What's up, Neil? This is already a mistake, I can tell. <laughs> Neil is winning the beard competition right now, and so I'll be catching up over the next several months. We'll see. (laughs) All right, so we've got a ton of news to cover. We're going to talk about the big iPad and Apple TV reviews. Neil, you actually had the Apple TV review and the remote, so we'll hit that in a bit. Yeah. We'll let you uh, rant on that. And you you and Andrew had a fun little discourse on Twitter about the remote, so... (laughs) We will get that. William, you got the new Apple TV as well, right? I do. I love it. You love it. Okay, I great. I don't know what anybody's complaining about. So I want to re- I used to have an Apple TV HD, so right. 4K is new to me, so that's what makes a difference. Oh. I want to re-watch everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Because it looks so much better. It does. It is very good. So we'll, we'll discuss that in depth in a minute before we get through some news. I also want to point out, I got to do a special interview with travel photographer Austin Mann, If you never heard of him, he does a review of the iPhone every year, specifically about the cameras. He goes to far off locations in Asia, Europe, Africa, all that. And he really puts the iPhone cameras through his paces. And he did an early review of the new iPad Pro with M1 and the liquid Retina XDR display. So he came on the podcast. We got to do a special interview with him. So check it out. It's the previous episode in your feed in whatever podcast player you use. So check it out. That was fun talking to Austin Mann. All right. So let's hit some news. First of all, Our friend John Prosser, who's just leaking everything recently, he actually had a leak of a new and redesigned Mac Mini. And so he works with a renders by Ian on Twitter. But this is a render of what a possible redesigned Mac Mini might look like. One that is a kind of pro-level Mac Mini. So, you know, we have the M1 Mac Mini now. But this one could be Apple's next chip, either the M1X or whatever they call it. And it's redesigned as well, as much as you can redesign a Mac Mini. I mean, it's a rounded corner square. And it's pretty flat, but it does look like it has four USB-C ports, whether or not that's USB-C or Thunderbolt. It does have two USB-A ports, supposedly, on this render. And he makes these renders from actual pictures he gets from leaks elsewhere, and plus Ethernet and HDMI. So that's pretty cool. Plus, it would be a, a pro-level Mac Mini, one with maybe more graphics performance, obviously faster CPU, or at least more cores. So I don't know. This looked pretty interesting to me. Does this tempt either of you as a new Mac Mini? I hate how much I like all these new Macs because I want to buy all this new yeah. iMac. It's like, man, it looks awesome, but you know, I, I can't do the M1. I, I have a PC that I need an external monitor for. I don't have the space for a second monitor. So it's like, oh, man, I wish Apple would make a monitor. It's like, well, maybe I could go to a desktop, but that MacBook Air is really good too. And if they made the MacBook Air <laughs> a bunch of colors, that would be it's like, I want to buy all of them. Like, yes. And it's like, ooh, that new iPad Pro. I could ditch my MacBook Pro entirely if they ran Mac OS on it. And then I could just get a Mac Mini, or maybe I could get that iMac. Like <laughs> the design on all of these, I'm just like obsessed with. I think they are the most amazing looking machines. I I, I want all of them. I just want to own them all. I, I do too. And I, I'm curious. You know, I have a LG Ultra Fine display, and thinking what more powerful Mac do I want to get? I thought about maybe I'll trade in this 13 inch M1 for whatever 14 inch redesign comes out. But then I'm like, maybe this will be my travel computer, and I get one of these Mac Minis and hook it up to the Ultra Fine. I don't know. William, does this tempt you at all? I know you just got an M1 Mac Mini, so... Yeah, I just (laughs) bought one. But, uh, Neil, I have the answer for you. Stephen gets everything, and then he passes them on to us. There you go. That's what happens. We haven't worked out the kinks yet, but that's the plan. That's the plan. But you've been happy with your M1, right, William? Uh, Actually delirious with it. I had problems converting to it. Uh, What do you call it? System migration stuff was horrible. Then uh, uh, even as just writing, it feels better. I'm several weeks in now, and I'm still grateful that I made the move. Yeah. So there's a bit of me that's kind of excited and thinking, no, calm down, just wait till it happens for it. And besides, anyway, I want the MacBook Pro if it's 14 right. inches, but I've just bought the Mac Mini. Yeah. Which there is a rumor about WWDC in the 14 inch, we'll get to in a second. What is interesting about this new Mac Mini, it has seemingly a similar magnetic power cable that resembles what the new M1 iMac has. I don't think they're calling it MagSafe. They're just saying it's a magnetic power cable. But it looks like it has that, this render of a Mac Mini. And we don't know. This could come out in the fall. This could come out next year. 
most likely the fall, I would think. I don't think Apple will wait that long if the M1X comes out and these new laptops and all. But I don't know. Do we think some kind of MagSafe or magnetic power connection is going to come to those new laptops? That was a rumor a few months ago that MagSafe was coming back. Do we think it's going to make a return? You know, I tweeted something about this when they announced the the first uh, iMac with that MagSafe connector and, and Ethernet in the brick. It doesn't make sense to me to bring the SD card slot back, right? That seems like kind of a step back. I guess they're going to do it. There's renders that are out there that are going to do it. But then I was wondering, like, what else could they put in the power brick? Like, what if it wasn't just Ethernet? What if it became, like, its own docking station? And that's admittedly appealing to me because I use Thunderbolt 3 quite extensively. And like you, uh, I have a LG Ultrafine display, which I absolutely hate uh, for a number of reasons, including the fact that it has bad ghosting on it. Yeah. And you can't really connect anything other than a Mac to it. Um, and I had to buy like a $100 VR cable from China to connect my Windows PC to this to this display oh, to get Lord. it to use the hub that's built in. Don't even get me started. It's not very attractive either. It's just no, kind of- it's it's yeah. I think my, my dream is that Apple sells some sort of uh, standalone display in the same colors as the iMac that I can use with whatever PC I want. Maybe it matches the color of the new Mac Mini and I could get that. And then if I were to get like a Mac Air, then you could have some Thunderbolt 3 style capabilities tucked away in a brick that's like under my desk. Stuff that I never touch, you know, like your Ethernet cable. You're not going to unplug or plug that in. And when, you, when you're undocked, you want to go wireless. But when you're docked, you want to have wired. So yeah. I think that that's a brilliant design decision. And I hope that they embrace it. And I hope that there are more accessories that come out for it. I'm not holding my breath because I'm also a big Smart Connector fan and I've been burned on that one a few times, but I, I am <laughs> praying that there is something that they, maybe they open it up to developers and maybe you could have like, you know, sure. a super power port on there where you connect one thing for everything. That would be pretty sweet. So that other rumor, this was, again, John Prosser saying, I can confirm MacBook Pro is coming at WWDC. So as you listen to this, the keynote from WWDC is just over a week away on June 7th. It'll be happening Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And again, we're going to hear all the software stuff. We're going to hear hopefully about a new iPad OS and iOS. Maybe we'll make some predictions on that as well. But hardware announcements at WWDC, sometimes they have them, sometimes they don't. Last year, the announcement was that Apple Silicon is coming, but they didn't announce devices. It was just Apple Silicon is coming. They sent out the developer test kits, which was a Mac mini with an A12Z processor. And so this year, it's wondering, will Apple announce some things? John Prosser is saying he confirms that the redesigned or updated MacBook Pro 14-inch and 16-inch, the pro-level MacBooks, will be coming at WWDC. So we'll see. There's been also rumors from Mark Gurman and Bloomberg about the insane amount of cores that these machines could have, M1X and all that. And also, I was listening to the Upgrade podcast with Jason Snell, and he made the point that historically, Apple has been beholden to Intel for how often they refresh their computers, laptops and desktops. But now that Apple controls the silicon, that just like the iPhone and iPad, that they get updated annually. I mean, every year they get a new chip, A12, 13, 14, 15. They could theoretically do that with the Mac. They could release an M1 MacBook Air last year like they did, and then this fall release another MacBook Air with an updated processor. Maybe it's redesigned, maybe not. What do you guys think? William, do you think that they'll start actually releasing these silicon updates regularly, or do you think they'll just you know, spread them out? I don't think they have to. No, they definitely don't, no. There's the expectation, the demand for the iPhone and less so for the iPad. For Macs, you would end up, would they, could they really refresh the entire line every year? I don't think it's, it's practical or even really desirable. Mm. So I think possible, but it doesn't feel that there's a benefit to them. So no. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with no, except they will release the Apple car at WWDC. I just want to throw that in because at some point I'm going to be right, you know, and I'll look amazing. Okay. It's it just... might be it might be years, though. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> it might be years. I don't know. Neil, what do you think? You think we're going to see hardware at WWDC? I think we're going to see hardware at WWDC. I think that you saw some of the announcements that have come out lately, like the fr- frankly botched uh, uh, lossless uh, and spatial music announcement that was so confusing that you yes. know as I as somebody who covers it for a living didn't fully understand it. Right. I, I think that they they rushed some stuff out because they were finalizing the presentation and realized oh we can't fit this in we better do something. Right. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot to talk about and I think part of that is going to be new hardware. Uh, the new MacBook Pros. I'm excited. I hope that they, I, I hope they come in colors. I hate this thing that Apple does where the Pro stuff is more serious. It doesn't come in colors. Yeah. The, the, the lower end stuff comes in colors because I'm really liking the colors, man. You know, like I got the, the blue iPhone 12 Pro last year, but like, why not? Why not have all the colors available for the Pro models, you know? Yeah. You know, I was actually, we're going to talk about the iPad Pro in a little bit, but I've gotten space gray everything for the last 
what, five years? I mean, since the 2016 MacBook Pros came out, iPads have been space gray. My computers have been space gray. iPhone, I went with the white one this year just to feel different, just to be different. And then I got the white Magic Keyboard, which I'll talk Regret. about in a second. Regret. <laughs> now, I will say this about the colors, though. Here's the interesting thing about the colors, right? Yeah. So the chips, the average consumer doesn't really understand the chips. They don't really care. And I think it's brilliant what Apple's done because they're going to create a super cycle because the nerds like us care about the chips and they're really excited about that. But the average consumer is watching these commercials on TV with this iMac that looks beautiful, it's thin, it's sure. got all these colors. Yeah. If they hadn't done the colors, they ran the risk, I think, of having a bunch of negative stories saying to average consumers, did you know that the new Macs can't run Windows? Did you know that they ditched Intel processors for their own? It's Apple doing it, and it would have been bad press. But now mm. it's like, ooh, look at all the colors. The colors are so pretty. <laughs> and I think yeah. I think it's going to be a home run. I think this is going to be the biggest year ever for the Mac. And I think it's just going to grow from there. I think that Apple knocked it out of the park. So let's say if they do new MacBook Pros at WWDC, maybe 14, 16 inch, and they come in colors, are you, you guys going to get a color? William, are you going to get a blue MacBook Pro? Yes. <laughs> there you go. Straight yes. Straight this yes. is actually why I think it's not going to happen, because I have a project that's been budgeted to buy a MacBook Pro, and I'm holding off in the hope that this will happen. <laughs> but that guarantee that's why I think John Prosser can confirm. I don't really know what that means right. uh, as much as he likes, but I, because I want one, it won't happen. But if it doesn't, it's in <laughs> colour, and I can pick which colour. And how blue is the blue, and is the front blue? Is the front, but How blue is yeah. the blue? Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, a lot of the iMac reviews that came out, first of all, I saw pictures of a silver iMac from some YouTuber and the silver actually looked really good to my surprise. You know, it seemed like it was the bland color, but it looks good. But I still think it's kind of weird that it's pastel on the front and then this rich, darker color on the back. Everyone's saying it looks amazing. I have yet to see one in person. Mm. Have either of you seen one in person? I haven't, no. Yeah. No, but I do like that two-tone. You do like it? Look to it, particularly with the white bezels around the pastel oh, okay. uh, chin. Just seems right. Yeah. If they announce a new MacBook Pro and a bunch of colors, I'm going to take out a second mortgage and I'm going to buy all of them. And then all mix, of them. I'm going to mix and match the colors depending on what oh, I'm wearing that day, just so I can <laughs> so everything can oh, match. Right. So we see you with a blue one. We know things aren't going well. <laughs> and red, I mean. Yeah, the, one of the, what's, everything's fine. What color is everything's fine? It's like one of those mood rings, the total uh, useless things that don't tell you anything, yes. but they change color. Yeah. In Florida, they don't work. They're just always like red. You know, whatever's the hot, whatever the hottest is. <laughs> just always overheated. That's all it reads. Well, WWDC is, is just over a week away, so stay tuned. We'll have a bunch of coverage on that, a recap episode of the keynote and all that fun stuff. Also, this is not a rumor. iOS 14.6 actually was released earlier this week. Supposedly, Apple lossless and some Dolby audio was supposed to become available. I haven't seen that yet. Apple Card Family, that is available. I, every time I open the wallet app on my iPhone, I see like an ad for Apple Card Family. Here's how to set it up, which that feels a little weird. I've dismissed it twice already. And then Apple Podcast subscriptions, which I'm curious if you guys have seen any, but the big feature of 14.6 is supposed to be podcast subscriptions. They're out. You could sign up for them. Creators can offer them. And I have yet to see any availability of any podcast subscription in the podcast app. I have not seen anything change. There's supposed to be channels where you can have like networks of podcasts. I'm not seeing any of that. Do either of you see that in the podcast app? No. No, but I just assumed Apple's end hadn't rolled out yet, that we're now ready for it whenever they flip the switch. But so far, no, I haven't seen. Well, I think I also haven't looked. I've, I look all the time because I wonder, you know, did our episode actually come out? That That's always the question. Yes. But the creator side, you can go to podcastconnect.apple.com. And, you know, I log in there and you've been able to set up everything since the event, like the event that happened what was April 20th, the spring loaded. You're able to start doing the channels and sign up for stuff. And so I'm going to log in right now, but um, all our stuff has been set up. Our subscription is supposedly ready to go. I've pushed every button to go live that they have. But on the creator side, there's this warning that says Apple podcast subscriptions are coming soon to get a head start, set up all your stuff. So like you say, William, on Apple's end, I guess it hasn't gone live, but it seems so strange to announce that as a feature of 14.6 that's now publicly available and none of the podcast stuff is out yet and no word when it will be out. And, and Neil, you, you haven't seen anything in the podcast space either, right? No, no. Like I said, between that and the, the Apple Music thing and all that, it, you know, in the last couple months, they kind of flipped the switch and said, well, we got to do this now because we don't have time for it later. And and I, I feel like some of these things, they just rushed out the door. There was a fourth thing in, uh, apparently in 14.6, uh, really complicated shortcuts run faster. Yes. I, th I thought I had complicated ones, and they do seem to fly, but I couldn't say it's twice as fast. Have either, are either of you big shortcuts 
uses? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Big, I'm actually going to use a bunch of them as I edit this show because I have some that pull in, you know, links and all that. So I will, I will report back. I saw that as news, but I uh, have not tried to run any really complicated ones yet. So my, a lot of my complicated ones are dependent on if this then that, which has a delay in and of its own. So man, that's a, that's integrating two automation things, man. That's serious. I know. Well, that's the only way to, to bridge the gap between HomeKit and some of the non HomeKit devices. Uh, unless you have Homebridge, so and you didn't, you try, you've tried Homebridge, right? And you don't didn't work for you. Well, having a, a standalone server was a problem. My Mac right. is a laptop, and you know, again, this is another reason I might get a Mac Mini because then it would yeah. always be on. It would be sitting there, you know, and just think, just saying, just talking myself into it a little bit. You see, you need it. Yes. You need it. That's you've right. got yeah. to it's have for it. Work. There you go. Exactly. It's exactly. a business. I, I had it set up on a Raspberry Pi before, and it crashed, and it was headless units, uh, and I had to, I had to, you know, ugh, it wasn't worth it. Forget that. So Forget that. I just do a three of this and that. Stephen, have you got any spare Mac servers you could send over? <laughs> to, just to I do. Uh, from your stash. I do have an old Mac. Not old. I mean, it's like a couple of year back Intel Mac Mini. I3, I think, whatever the, whatever the lowest uh, I you could Intel. get. But it runs Homebridge great. And so that, that's why I, I stick with Homebridge because that Mac Mini runs it. And then I can use it as a Plex server if I wanted to get an external hard drive and, and do that. Things that you probably never do, but it's nice if you want I to. use the Homebridge a, a ton. So well, I, mean, good, I, I, I start my Roomba with, with my HomePod. I feel like every super nerdy friend that I have spends more time setting up their stuff and building it than they do actually using it. It's, just, <laughs> it's a hobby in and of itself, getting it set up the way you want. I'm guilty of it yeah. too, believe me. I, I will say the, the one super useful thing in Homebridge, we've talked about this on the HomeKit Insider podcast, was my security system was through Vivint, which is not HomeKit enabled, but someone made an incredible... Vivint plugin for Homebridge. So all of my door and window contact sensors, my alarm panel, my doorbell, cam, and lock, because of Homebridge, I can get all of that in HomeKit. Nice. And so I can use Siri to unlock my front door, all my contact sensors integrate there. So that was the one, like the security system integration was the one reason why like Homebridge was actually meaningful. But as I also mentioned on the upcoming episode of HomeKit Insider, we are moving. And so I am leaving my current residence and leaving a lot of my smart home stuff behind because I'm going to go all new. We're, we're building a house. And so I'm going to try and make it so I don't have to use any Homebridge anything. I don't, I don't want to try and go through those plugins and stuff. So nice. I'll report through that process as we go. <laughs> but Apple Card family, you can now set up Apple Card for children ages 13 years or older. You can have like child with spending limits and all that kind of stuff. And you can combine uh, two partners and you can both have a card and combined credit limits and all that. And Apple was really pushing it again. Every time I opened the wallet app, I saw that ad. But honestly, I have no desire to, to set this up. Uh, my, my oldest son is 12, so he doesn't even qualify. But I don't know if I would do it even when he turns 13. I didn't have a credit card when I was 13, but I don't know. What are you guys' thoughts on the Apple Card family stuff? It feels a little sleazy. Okay. I, it always seems strange to me, like where you see like these banks and stuff, they're advertising, like, get, get your kid's credit started early. And it's like, yeah, let's get you Sucked into the system that's totally going to rip you off <laughs> if you can't pay your bills every month. Like, <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Neil. Maybe maybe start them with a debit card. I mean, I don't have kids, so I'm the wrong person to comment on this, but maybe start them with a debit card so they learn yeah. some financial responsibility instead of a credit card where they can spend money they don't have and end up right. paying 20% interest rate when they miss a payment one month, like basic finance. Yeah, no, that's true. I don't know, William, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I'm in the UK. I can't get oh, this right. at all. We still can't get Apple Card. You just enjoy yourselves. <laughs> <Fine>. <laughs> so sorry. So sorry. Well, that's that's Apple Card family. I, we'll put a link in show notes. You can read about that. This episode is brought to you by Every Plate. Every Plate makes home cooking easy and affordable and is a much cheaper alternative to takeout, but just as delicious. Now, listen, I'm not a super cook at home guy either. I can make some eggs. I can make some toast, but when it comes to full meals, I have trouble finding recipes and knowing how to plan it. And every plate is the affordable way where you can get all the ingredients sent to you in a convenient box. They send you multiple recipes in that box and it makes delicious meals in 30 minutes or less. Think about it. You can do away with having to grocery shop, trying to find those recipes. Every plate can do it all for you. They provide easy to follow recipe cards that look amazing, by the way. They have pre-portioned ingredients and you can spend less time prepping and cooking and more time enjoying good food with family or loved ones. The Every Plate offers a changing menu of 14 recipes per week, and it features a range of flavors and ingredients so you will never get bored. With Every Plate, it's easy and affordable to cook hearty, delicious, family-pleasing meals. 
and every plate is 50% cheaper than a meal made from the grocery store ingredients. So now is the perfect time to focus on saving money easily. I've tried multiple meals from every plate and they were always delicious and I made them myself. And I was actually kind of proud I was able to cook this full meal all on my own. I tried the sriracha pork stir fry, which was delicious, sweet and tangy cherry meatballs, and a garlic rosemary chicken. And it's so convenient because you have all the ingredients right there in the box. You just add some salt and pepper. You follow the step-by-step -step instructions, which are easy to follow, and you have a full meal ready to go. And if you get a meal with multiple people, you make the extra food and you save it for lunch the next day and you can take it to work or on the go. And so you already have meals planned for the next day. Super convenient. And again, the most affordable it's super convenient, and one meal from every plate is the same price as a cup of coffee you get from the other places. So get started with every plate for just $1.99, that's $1.99 per meal, plus an additional 20% off another two weeks by going to everyplate.com and entering the code APPLEINSIDER199. That's all one word, APPLEINSIDER199. So go to everyplate.com, click that Get Started button, and use the promo code APPLEINSIDER199 at checkout. That promo code and link is also in the show notes, so you can check it out there. Our thanks to EveryPlate for sponsoring this episode. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Pharmacy. You've probably heard of Amazon before. You know, they have that free two-day shipping when you're a Prime member. Let me tell you about getting your prescription medications through Amazon Pharmacy. You can get that same two-day free shipping, and Amazon Pharmacy works with most insurance providers here in the United States, and you can get those prescriptions delivered right to your door, just like you do everything else from Amazon. It's super easy to use. Amazon Pharmacy actually works with your doctor. Your doctor can send the prescription directly to Amazon Pharmacy, and then your prescription just shows up at your door two days later. We all know the hassle of going to the pharmacy, having to give them the prescription, come back later if it's not ready right away. Well, you can eliminate all of that hassle and waiting in line. And if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, not only do you get that free two-day shipping with your prescription medications, but if you don't use insurance, you can actually save money on those prescriptions when you use Amazon Pharmacy. Listen, I personally use Amazon for everything from toilet paper and paper towels to other supplements and medications that I get from Amazon. And now using it for prescription medications just makes life a whole lot easier, super easy to use, just like you use Amazon for everything else. So I encourage you to try it. Get with your doctor. They can work with Amazon Pharmacy to get your prescriptions sent automatically and delivered to your house. So remember, Amazon Prime members, you can save on prescription medication when not using insurance and get free two-day delivery. Learn more at amazon.com slash appleinsiderrx. That's amazon.com slash appleinsiderrx, all one word. Amazon.com slash appleinsiderrx. Our thanks to Amazon Pharmacy for sponsoring this episode. And I wanted to do one more follow-up on the Apple Music lossless versus spatial audio and all that. Well, one, lossless audio will come to HomePod the large HomePod, and I think the HomePod mini also, it's the whole HomePod family. So somehow Apple's going to do something where you'll have some kind of lossless audio uh, on HomePod. But then I also had someone reach out. He was from the UK. His name is Craig. This guy's an audiophile. This is what I was asking for. I said, audiophile, reach out. And so he really feels like there is a difference between Tidal using their high quality streaming and other things like Spotify and Apple Music through his system I didn't know what any of these pieces of equipment were, but he uses a Lin Magic, that's L-I-N-N-M-A-J-I-K, a, a DSM amplifier. This thing's $3,800. Like, this is not cheap. And it is an amplifier that you can stream title directly through it, or you can plug in other audio devices. And he's got that going out to some KEF R300 speakers. Again, hadn't heard of those, but they're like really good speakers, apparently. And he said through a system like that, it is noticeable when you have not as compressed audio coming through a service like Tidal. So for those of you who have setups like this or you're wanting to spend some money and, and get really good music, there's apparently a difference. It's noticeable by people. Craig, you know, he walked me through kind of his setup and stuff. I'll put links to those pieces of equipment if you're interested in it. But Apple Music Lossless, you can maybe hear a difference in some of this, some of this other stuff. A $10 a month all you can download service hooked up to, you know, tens of thousands. This is like, Going to a to an all you can eat CC's pizza buffet for like nine ninety nine and saying, but if you bring your fine dining ware, 
it's really great. Like, I mean, come on. Well, you know, like, I, I, that, that analogy is a little <laughs> off, I think, because they're saying it's not just CeCe's Pizza. You got CeCe's Pizza over here, but then you have like the New York Tony's Pizza in the middle. And then you got whatever other New York places, like the real New York pizza. <laughs> and I think they're saying if you bring the nice silverware, you can have the nice Tony's pizza. This is a horrible analogy. This, I, I wish you had never said anything. This is coming. terrible. But I, I think that's the idea. Listen, as somebody who listens to way too much music, you can see it's just on video, all the vinyl that I have behind me and all that. Yeah, yeah. I have a very large collection of music. I enjoy music. I have a nice sound system set up. I have uh, nice headphones, nice speakers, y- you name it. Uh, this just seems like complete overkill. Nobody's going to hear the difference. It doesn't really matter. You don't think you'll have any difference either, even with your stuff? Probably not. No, it probably won't make hmm. very much of a difference. A lot of the st- a lot of the music I listen to sounds like it was recorded in a garage, anyhow. You know. Oh. Um, <laughs> well. Yeah, I mean, when you listen to when you listen to some pretty grungy stuff like I do, you know, it's a little different. But like, it, it reminds me of like uh, uh, when you know they remixed all the Beatles stuff in stereo, and like they went overkill on it because like stereo is a new invention. Right. And you listen to it, and it's like let's put all of the instrument in one discrete channel, and you listen to it, it's like this sounds like crap. This sounds terrible. Like who mixed yeah, yeah, yeah. this? You know, they overdid it. Sure. There are some things like uh, uh, Flaming Lips did an album uh, uh, years ago uh, that uh, you, it required four record players with four sets of stereo speakers <laughs> to cr- hear it the way that it was meant to be mixed. So they people in like the 90s would have to get there together with like listening parties to do it. I want to hear that in spatial audio on on Apple Music where I can only hear it the way that it was meant to be done. Or maybe a live concert and you get like an immersive experience. That's the stuff that sounds really cool to me, but this lossless stuff, I just don't think anybody's going to hear the difference. Gotcha. But you remember the story that Elvis Presley uh, used to refuse to listen to the mixing desk output. He would always go have it routed through a transistor radio because that's how people were going to listen to it. And that's what he mixed to or his engineers did. I don't think things are always meant to be as pristine as they are in studio. I have a friend an audiophile, Steve Fitzpatrick, who years ago got ever better hardware and suddenly at one point said he could actually hear a a, a new guitar track in the middle of some famous track, possibly Beatles. And it was incredibly clear it never had been before. And I just never had the nerve to ask him whether he he liked that extra guitar (laughs) track because he spent a lot of money and it had changed his music in front of him. Yeah, dig me out of this. I feel like I'm heading for a hole. You make make a good point. And and the way that people listen to music is very different. Like, you know, I grew up listening to the radio, like a lot of people, you know, before you could have easy access to CDs and all and tapes and all that sort of stuff. And I remember listening to uh, The Ocean by Led Zeppelin. And the, the soft part of that song was always very loud on the radio because when they broadcast on the radio, they would equalize and make the soft parts loud, the loud parts soft. And yeah. then when you got the actual record and it was so soft and you had to turn it up and it was just a very different experience listening to it that way. It almost made you listen to it louder. And, you know, I think that, you know, the way that people listen to music is so dynamic and it's great that this is out there. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's fine. Yeah. I'm just saying the vast majority of people who don't have that setup are not going to hear the difference. And even if they did have that setup, they probably wouldn't hear the difference. And- well, we will see. I don't supposedly have you guys seen any tracks in Apple Music that actually have the lossless or Dolby audio next to it? I downloaded the new St. Vincent over the last weekend and it said master for Apple Music. Is that different? I think that is different. That's something that's been around. I had never seen that logo before, and I was like, oh, maybe this is what it is. It just says Apple Digital Master. No, I remember that coming in. I keep checking the Kids from Fame albums, and there's nothing, no difference there yet. Okay. One other news bit before we get to iPad and Apple TV. Amazon, big announcement this week, actually acquired MGM Studios for something like $8.4 billion. And, you know, a couple pretty big franchises as part of MGM, the 007 James Bond series being one of them. And just a huge purchase for something like Amazon, who's showing that they are very serious about streaming. The streaming wars continue. You got Apple TV Plus and Amazon, Disney Plus, and you still have Netflix around. So pretty wild deal. I'm not sure how I feel about the constant consolidation of these companies. I feel like obviously you get less choice, less options, less competition, but they did it. And so they bought it and that's going to be part of Amazon now. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not surprised it's, it's Amazon. You know, when you're looking at companies like this, they've got money to burn, so they don't even care if they lose money on it. They yeah, subscribers yeah, so they can true. please their investors. Thought? Bond is, is the big headline everybody talks about for it, but Jeff Bezos' Amazon now owns The Apprentice, and there are the famous alleged outtakes of a former U.S. president. I, let's not get into politics here, but it's been a big issue for a few years of what has been recorded and not shown, uh, and now whether Amazon actually has the rights to put them out mm. and things is genuinely an issue. It's potentially riveting. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. All right. So that was it for the news. 
let's talk about iPad. So I got my, my iPad Pro here. I got my new Yay. 12.9 inch iPad Pro. Oh. Do I do I discuss the keyboard first, the smart keyboard? Please. I don't know if you guys saw my tweet thread. All right. So I went with the white magic keyboard because I wanted to be different. I wanted to feel like one of the cool kids. I you know, I like how it looks. It looks cool. It's different for sure. And when I recorded a video, uh, you can check it out. I'll put a link to the video in the show notes. But I did kind of a podcaster's review of the iPad Pro, seeing the differences between this M1 2021 version and my 2018 version. I had the 11-inch, so pretty big difference overall. And I'll mention those in a second. But as I was filming that video, I put this down on a table outside. We were filming outside. Didn't think about dirt because I've had black and space gray everything, so I just don't think about it. And when I picked it up, I actually reacted to it in the video when I saw it. But the whole bottom part was just black all around the edges, smudges, like nasty. Like it was immediately very dirty. And I tried doing like lick my finger and rub it and it just smudged it everywhere. So I didn't know what to do. I was like, okay, maybe I'm just going to return this tomorrow. I don't know. But I brought it home. I found the Apple support article that talks about cleaning your Apple devices. And I know at Apple Insider, we've covered a bunch of how to clean your Apple stuff. So I won't go into all that. But the key was what to use to clean it. And it's isopropyl alcohol. They say 70%. I don't know what percentage I had. I just found a bottle that said alcohol and I just used it. And it seemed to work. I got it white again. All the dirt came off pretty easily and it looked like new again. So I was like, okay, maybe we can hang with this. But silly me, I don't know. I never had a bad experience with bleeding clothes in the wash. So I just didn't think about this. But I was using a red microfiber cloth to wipe the white magic keyboard. And I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but I can get rubbing kind of hard when I want something really clean. Like I really get in there and I really kind of, you know, rub hard. And that cloth with the alcohol started making a red line where I was rubbing. And by the time I noticed it was too late, I took the cloth away and it was like pink. Like this whole bottom edge was just pink from the red cloth. And I said, what, did I, what have I done? And I think it's over. You know, it's over. I'm not going to, I don't know what to do. And it's still a little pink. But what I did, this is not in the Apple support article. I'm not going to recommend it, although it worked for me. I took bleach, as you do, like if you're cleaning up a crime scene. And I said, <laughs> I'm going to try bleach because, you know, bleach, you bleach white things. And this thing is white. So why not? Let me bleach the white thing. And so I used bleach on that spot with all the pink stuff. And it's like 90% gone. Like, I don't think you guys will be able to see it. Like, it's very faint, but it's still, yeah, you can't see it. So, you know, that's the point. If you can't see it, it's not there-ish. You know, I could see it a little bit, but it it got most of the pink off. It is now basically white again. So, all that to say, if you get the white Magic Keyboard, I do think it looks cool. It looks nice. It's different. And it's cleanable. Cleanable. I don't know, you know, if you get a coffee stain on this thing, I don't know how that's going to go. I don't know if isopropyl alcohol is going to take care of a coffee stain. But for the time being, mine is still white after a week, despite a dirt uh, table situation. So anyway, that's the white magic keyboard. Any questions from the audience? I quite like the idea of a pink one. You kind of Paddingtoned it, <laughs> didn't you? Okay. Before you tipped gin or whatever yeah. it was that you said. <laughs> it just poured whiskey all yeah, over the thing it and it work. just uh, cleaned it right up. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was, it was dirty. I mean, it was dirty, but and now, and now it looks okay. I mean, I do like it. I like the white look. I don't know how I feel about this. Every time I look at, I got the space gray iPad in Apple's product imagery, they only show the silver iPad with the white magic keyboard. And I know it's not a big deal. You know, they, you could do whatever you want, but I don't know. I don't know how I feel about like the gray, the space gray and the white. I guess it's fine. I don't know. The moral of the story is you treat it like you're in the eighties and you're collecting action figures or Barbie dolls mm. and you never take it out of the box because otherwise it immediately loses <laughs> its value. It might, it might have. And there, there's a lot of value in a magic keyboard for <laughs> iPad. Yeah, three three hundred fifty dollar keyboard. Yeah, but I, I do like it. I like the bigger size too. So I have the eleven inch iPad Pro uh, that it was on its way to William, but then it got uh, diverted because of trade in value. Sorry, it's the trade in value wins. It just took it away. You know what I mean? It's it's one of those currents. <laughs> Sorry, you can't see, but we're actually looking at each other in video. If you're listening to the podcast, William's just rolling his eyes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I do like the bigger size of the twelve point nine inch, the keyboard because it's it's wider. You know, it comes with it. So you have. The actual iPad. So I got the, the Space Gray 12.9 inch. And in my workflow, I did notice speed increases in editing podcasts. Exporting is two to three times faster. So when I export the MP3 of this show, right. it definitely did it faster than 2018. I did a side-by-side comparison in the video. So that's cool. Multitasking, definitely better. 16 gigs of RAM in this model. So if I have 
bear ride on one side and I have safari or bear notes or whatever on the other side. Super fluid, super fast. So I definitely notice the difference there. So that's all great. And the screen, I do find it looks better. Like it is noticeably better than the previous iPad Pro screen. There's been mixed uh, opinions on this from different reviewers, but I do find it looks noticeably better. And not just watching content like, you know, an HDR movie. Like I do actually find it, it pops more. The colors look really good. So I'm about the screen. I love it. And again, Austin Mann in, in our interview talked about editing photos on this is great. This episode is brought to you by the Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower. You've heard about Nebbia before. I still use the Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower and still love it every day. Nebbia started in Mexico City where water shortages were a big problem. So they moved to Silicon Valley to try and get investment and they had none other than Apple CEO Tim Cook invest in Nebbia. And then developers and engineers from NASA, Tesla, and Apple work together to create a superior shower experience while saving water. That's the mission of the Nebbia company. And to this date, they have saved over 175 million gallons of water. That's a lot of water. Now, and I know it can seem intimidating to maybe switch out your shower head yourself. And that's not something I had ever done before doing it with the Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower. But let me tell you, the instructions they give you, all the parts, it's super easy to do. I actually did it in less than 15 minutes. And you can do it with most shower heads. It's a piece of cake. And they walk you through every step. And then once you get it installed, it's just a great shower experience. It's height adjustable. You can move it up and down. I actually got one with the shower wand, which is really cool. It attaches magnetically to this little dome on the side of the shower. And it atomizes the water, that's a fancy word for it, for basically enveloping you in water. It feels great. It has great thermal comfort. I got that word from them, which means it gets really hot. And the rinseability is excellent. No matter the shampoo or conditioner, the Nebby by Moen Spa Shower can rinse it thoroughly. And it's just a great and superior shower experience. Even my kids love it. They take a shower with it every day. This is Nebbia's most advanced and affordable shower yet, starting at just $199, and it saves 45% of water compared to a standard shower head. It also comes in four beautiful finishes. I got the brush to nickel. It's fingerprint resistant. Looks great in my bathroom. And I got some accessories. I got the shower shelf where you can hang some loofahs and put shampoos and conditioners on top and towel hooks all in that brush nickel finish, and they all look great. Right now, you can get 15% off Nebbia products because you're a listener of the Apple Insider podcast. Nebbia doesn't usually do sales, but they've partnered with us for a long time, and this is a great opportunity to upgrade your shower experience while saving water at the same time. So go to nebbia.com slash Apple Insider. That's N-E-B-I-A dot com slash Apple Insider. Take a look around and then use the coupon code Apple Insider, all one word, when checking out. That's nebbia.com slash Apple Insider. A thanks to Nebbia for sponsoring this episode. This episode is brought to you by Upstart. Trying to pay off debt can feel like an uphill battle. Whether it's high interest rates or you have multiple credit cards and other loans, it can feel difficult even if you're just able to make those minimum monthly payments. Well, Upstart is where you can get a personal loan to consolidate some of that high interest debt and you can do it all online. Whether you have to pay off those credit cards, that high interest debt, or maybe you want to fund a personal expense, over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple fixed monthly payment. Unlike other lenders, Upstart looks at more than just your credit score, like your income and employment history. This means they can offer smarter rates with trusted partners. And with a five minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And you can receive those funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to Upstart dot com slash Apple Insider. That's upstart, U-P-S-T-A-R-T dot com slash Apple Insider. And don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. So go to upstart dot com slash Apple Insider to learn more. Our thanks to Upstart for sponsoring this episode. The story that everyone is saying and I almost don't want to say it because it's tiring, but iPad OS is the only drawback. It's the only thing holding this piece of hardware back. It's got an M1, 16 gigs of RAM, the same specs as the MacBook Pro I'm using to record video and audio and use multiple devices with a dock. And this has the same internals. This iPad Pro is the exact same computer inside and it can't do anywhere near as much as my Mac can. And I tried it just to be sure. I tried pulling up Skype and Fairrite Recording Studio side by side, 
You can pull them up side by side, but as soon as you start a Skype call or as soon as you start recording, iPad OS says, eh, only one app can use an audio device. And again, all of us right now on this call are using either a camera or an audio device in multiple places, both in Zoom, so you can hear the good mic so we can all hear each other, and we're recording that audio separately. And the iPad, you just can't do it. It's just not an option. There's no setting. There's no way any app can build it in. There's no developer that can access the audio settings to do that. And it is strictly hindered by that. This might be a different story two weeks from now after the WWDC keynote and iPad OS and all, but that's, that's the drawback. And it's still the software side. It's still the same iPad story that we've had for three years, 2018 till today. It's, it's the same. It's like, it's like you own a rocket ship, but you're stuck on the ground and you're going through a school zone. Like, I see how you abandoned the pizza analogy. I thought you were, I thought you were gonna make a CC well, yeah. analogy. You win some, you win some, you lose some. But yeah, uh, my my fine cutlery. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's been said a million times, but it's true. It's the reason I haven't bought one yet because yeah. I want one very badly. But now they're offering sixteen gigs of RAM, and it's like for what? Yeah. You know, and you got to spend I think eighteen hundred dollars minimum just to get to the model that has sixteen gigs of RAM. Yeah, because you got to get a terabyte. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like, man, I would love to have a iPad with sixteen gigs of RAM. What am I gonna do with it? Like, you know. Give me something to do with it and then I'll do it. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of the things where even Austin Mann was talking about, he wants to import from an SD card and save to an external hard drive. And even that is not really possible at the same time. And it, the iPad sees them both. It's not even like I can't see two things at once. The iPad can see both, but it's just copying or whatever, like it's just the software. It just won't let you do it. So I don't know. Just let it dual boot and run Mac OS and be done. Ah. You know, they can slowly add all these features to iPad OS. But there should be an option when you connect a keyboard or a trackpad to say, oh, you're running a Mac. I'm going to say, I've asked everyone this, and I haven't really had an opinion yet, but I I don't think I want Mac OS on iPad. As I want the flexibility. I want the ability to have utilities that are system-wide, like clipboard managers and audio device you know, management, like audio hijack. I want those things, but I'm okay with iPad minus multitasking. Like multitasking is still a nightmare. Like that just needs to be redone. How many apps do you have open on your Mac right now, on your screen that you can see? How many How many apps? I got Safari, Messages, Slack, Audio Hijack, Zoom, Notes. Yeah, so six. I got six. Yeah, and I mean, if you were multitasking on an iPad and doing all those at once with the current interface, how would it work? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you need to have a windowed interface with a cursor in order to use more than two apps. Right. And so if you want to do true power user stuff, you're going to need to do more than two apps at once. And so you're going to need to yeah. completely rethink the interface for, for non-touch first uses. Absolutely. But I don't think you need macOS for that. You don't. You know, you could have windowed managed apps, maybe the four up. You know, maybe Apple could do some kind of four up thing where you have four corners, an app in each corner. Maybe it's only on the 12.9 inch and you, or something like that, plus slide over. You know, if you had four plus slide over, because half of these apps, like Audio Hijack's running in the background, I don't need to see that. Zoom, you know, I'm looking at you guys. Messages I just have open, but I'm not actively looking at it. If you could do four up and maybe with a slide over feature, I feel like that alone could suffice and do what it needs to do. I mean, but they need to rethink the interface and how you open the apps and how oh absolutely Absolutely. (laughs) like i i still cannot figure out how to properly multitask on an ipad like some apps don't support it you drag it out it doesn't work and it's like what is going on here you know they still just need to fix bugs too because i can't tell you how many times i have side-by-side apps and i'm just trying to copy from one side and paste in the other app and the ipad just refuses to change the active app like it just won't let me paste in notes when i've copied from safari and i literally have to slide it over to make safari go away and then i can paste in notes and that that is frustrating for sure i i hear you guys on not wanting to have mac on the ipad but the thing is it's it just feels like you're making a very roundabout way to solve a solution that's right in front of you it's like here it is and i think the way that you could do it is if you think about it on a Mac, they years ago introduced the app launcher or whatever they call it, and it looks exactly like an iPad screen with a bunch of with a grid of icons. Right. And you can do a multi touch gesture to access it and get to your apps right quick. Imagine if it worked the same in reverse on an iPad, where you would have a pro desktop mode that you could jump into very quickly and it would work seamlessly w- within the iPad OS. Right. Then you could do true multitasking. You connect a, a trackpad and a keyboard, and it's like, okay, now you're in pro mode. Let's do something that way. I, I think there's a way to maintain the integrity of the iPad and its OS yeah. and making it touch first and making it the device that you need when you just have your fingers or a pencil there. But then when you attach more accessories to it, you can turn it into a true pro machine. I think you're doing what you just said we were doing if 
not wanting Mac OS. You would have to contort Mac OS to make it what I think I and Stephen are thinking is build up iPad OS to do more things. And, and it feels like that's the organic root of it, shoving Mac OS in it and fidgeting around. It actually makes me think of Windows, the way in Windows 10 you're doing something and suddenly it feels like it crashes out to the older version right. of Windows for a control panel right. or something. Um, grow it organically rather than fudge something in, I think. I mean, I currently use uh, uh, Mac OS on my iPad with Sidecar. Works great. <laughs> right. And I do get like... So so many elements are shared. The dock is shared. iPad has a dock. Mac has a dock. The apps run universally. Yeah, yeah. The, the apps run universally. You have Launchpad on Mac, which well, I, didn't, I never use. You know, no. But Spotlight, you have Spotlight in both places. You can command spacebar and search. A lot of the shortcuts are shared by both OSs. So I get like it's already, even I think in past events have said we're going back to the Mac with serv- you know features we built on iOS. We're going to bring those back to the Mac. And then they've said on stage vice versa. With This is a great feature on Mac. We're going to bring it to iPad or, or iPhone. And so like I get it's, it's getting closer together, but I still think there is value. I can't exactly articulate exactly why, but as keeping them separate operating systems. And maybe you know, with all the antitrust stuff and the stuff that came out in the Epic court case, maybe it is just the idea that they don't want to have iPad OS be an operating system where you can install apps outside the app store, that they want users who use iPad and iPhone to only use the app store. And if you put Mac OS on an iPad, you immediately open up for anyone. You could download any app from anywhere. Do I want that or not? You know, I'm not sure. Again, if I could get Audio Hijack on an iPad, that might make me want to say, let me get it out of the app store. Let me get Audio Hijack however I can get it, no matter what. And Audio Hijack needs to do that because of how it accesses even the Mac. That's why they can't go through the Mac app store. They have to sell it separately. So, so I don't know. I, I, w- I just want to see better multitasking. I would love to see better support for background audio managing audio devices, you know, all that kind of stuff. Side-by-side multitasking, just ne- it needs to be revamped for sure. So I- I'm with you there. Let, let me say something nice to end yeah, this please. bit with. When you said what apps are we using and I counted, I've got 23 open apps. 23? One of them I realize is Final Cut Pro and I haven't actually edited video for two days. Now I forgot to quit it and everything's fun. I didn't notice it was open. Whereas on my old Intel Mac mini, I would have been forced to yeah. quit by now to just carry on with other things. So M1 is great. Whatever the software is and, running. And also, thank you, William, for having 23 open apps the first time we tried to do a video call. <laughs> <laughs> Not even think what could go wrong? Yeah, I admit, I didn't think about <laughs> Including it. Including <laughs> Final Cut. <laughs> but that's fine. That's fine. It's working fine. So very good. All right, well, we got to talk about the Apple TV. Neil, Neil had the big review. And I'll just say I have the Siri remote with me so I could uh, you know, click the buttons as we discuss, discuss it. But uh, we all got it. The box, you know, what can you say about the box? It's got Wi-Fi 6. It's got thread. You can do HDR content at 60 frames per second, a little faster. Like that's the box. That's the whole the whole deal. And the big thing is the remote. So, well, Neil, why don't you tell me? Do you have any other additions to the box? And then, how do you feel about the remote? Well, you know, I know uh, William, you were saying that you like your your Apple TV, um, and I, I think you should. It's a great device. You, if you just upgraded to a 4K model, you know, absolutely, that 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 is a, a great upgrade. But when I'm doing a review like this, I have to compare it to the last model, which came out four years ago, and the processor is not only a, a kind of a lateral move. In some ways, it's actually a worse processor. So the previous chip that was in there, the A10X, uh, I believe it had 12 graphics cores. Is that what it was? Something like that? Mm. And then the A12 Bionic has four graphics cores. My understanding of the way the chip works, and again, there are no benchmark apps available, so we cannot say for sure. But if you're doing something that's not graphics intensive, like streaming video or, you know, two-dimensional things, you know, dealing with the interface, that sort of thing, um, yeah, it's snappier, it's faster because the clock speed is faster on the core chip. The graphics processing, however, we haven't been able to really benchmark it, but the assumption is that it's going to be slower because of just fewer cores. It's just, there's a blog that's uh, focused on uh, fitness stuff called DC Rainmaker, and uh, the, the guy who runs it did a side-by-side test of some uh, biking app where it connects to the Apple TV and you can get on a bike and you do a 3D virtual bike ride. And he showed that on the 2017 model, it rendered shadows for the environment. Mm. And on the 2021 model, it didn't render shadows. Mm. So I didn't put any of that in my review because the truth is I don't really know. Right now, the apps haven't been optimized. It's, you know, there's all kinds of variables. It's possible Apple did something custom with the A12 Bionic to overclock it to make it more powerful for graphics processing. You have to consider that the other versions of the A12 Bionic that exist are in the entry-level iPad and uh, the iPad Mini, which are battery-powered and don't have an active fan. Apple TV is plugged into a wall, and it has a active cooling on it, so it could be overclocked. There are all kinds of variables here that make it impossible to say what exactly is going on in terms of processing power. 
What I can say with some relative certainty is that uh, all the things that make the M1 great and, and Tim Cook's supply chain genius of getting everything consolidated to uh, to one chip, one chip to rule them all, the devices are running on it, makes it simple, makes it efficient, makes it cheaper, makes it so that they can squeeze a few more dollars out of these devices if you want to be cynical about it. Well, that's what's happening. So the A10X that was in the previous generation Apple TV is not in any more Apple. It's not being manufactured. Anymore. And you're talking about, in terms of Apple's larger products lineup, a pretty low margin, a low low volume device, I should say. Mm. So I don't know how many they're selling a quarter. Maybe it's a couple million, but it's far less than an iPad. It's far less than an iPhone. It's, it's just not, they don't even break it out in terms of sales units because it's a, it's a niche device. Right. And so basically what I assume happened, because Apple will never admit to it, they'll never tell anybody, is they didn't want to manufacture the A10X anymore because they were just making it for one device. But the A12 Bionic is in the entry-level iPad, and it's in the iPad Mini. Mm. And so it made sense to roll that over, and it was just a minor spec bump, and then they needed to get a new remote out there because everyone hated the old one. So this is a way for them to do it. And then you get some benefits from it, like you get 60 frames per second HDR. Um, they updated it to an HDMI 2.1 port, which I'm not sure that it actually means anything because I'm not even sure that this processor is capable of 120 frames per second content. You would get Wi-Fi 6. You get the eARC, which was a feature that I don't think we knew about until it came out. But the eARC where you can push audio from other devices through HDMI to like your home pods if you have them connected to it. Which, okay, that, I mean, I'm glad that, that exists. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad there's a way to take stuff from your Blu-ray player sure. and put it on your home pod. The problem is, if you are playing Blu-rays, you can get those same content in 4K on the iTunes Store or any streaming service. I think it's more for video game systems. You know, if you have a no, PS5. but it's not. No, oh, it doesn't because work. There's that way? way too much lag. Uh, so we test it, and so here's the thing: it only works for video content because then they can sync up the audio and the video. But if you're playing games, you can't do that. The controller gets out of sync, mm. so you can't use it for playing video. Games. So it's useful for basically two cases: Blu-rays or discs that you own, which is you know a use case. I'm sure there are five people out there that can do that. Good for you. And then the other the other use case for it is uh, if you have a cable box, a legacy cable box. Both of these are things that can be replaced by apps or streaming services. So mm. is it nice that you can play external content to your HomePod through your Apple TV? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm glad it's there. Is it worth $188 upgrade for the vast majority of people who are going to buy this thing? No. So, you know, I got roasted in the comments on Twitter and all that because I gave it a 2.5 out of 5. Fine. Go ahead and say what you want. It, I didn't say it's a bad device. I didn't say it's terrible. William is in disbelief. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I would realize you gave it a two point five. I love either. my Apple TV. No, and you should. I love mine. I use it every single day. But you have you cannot review something in a vacuum. It needs to be sure, compared sure. to the previous generation device. It needs to be compared to what came before it. It needs to be compared to what else is on the market. It's le- way less powerful than any gaming console, um, you know, that starts at, you know, $250, $300. Games. It's yeah. way more powerful than a streaming stick, but it doesn't do anything much more than that other right. than play a handful of games with pretty low quality graphics comparatively. I like Apple Arcade. I play games on Apple Arcade. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I I stream Hulu as my cable provider. I ditched my cable box and I went right. st- straight to Hulu Live. Right. Um, I stream hockey games all the time. I'm a big Tampa Bay Lightning fan. They just won last night. Hooray. Build my life around that. It's all on my Apple TV. I play games. I have Moonlight on my Windows PC. I stream that to my 4K TV so I can play uh, Windows PC games on my Apple TV. I love my Apple TV. I had to give it a 2.5 out of 5 because for anybody who has either waited for four plus years for this model yeah. or who has owned the previous generation model, there is zero reason to upgrade except for the remote. If you own the 2017 4K Apple TV um, and you, you know, don't need Wi-Fi 6 there's or, or you don't want to, you know, yeah. stream your Blu-rays from your Apple TV to your HomePod, there's no reason to buy this. There's absolutely zero reason to plunk down $180 for it. So should we just agree then it's an absolutely perfect 2.5 star rating? <laughs> yes. Blissful 2.5. Yes. Give me your quick thoughts on the Apple TV Siri remote, Neil. It's great. I really like it. I was skeptical when I saw that they were uh, going to like a, a click interface for navigation, but they did a, a perfect job of merging the two. So you yeah. can do the touch interface that existed before. They added a great click interface that's clear. The scrub wheel uh, scrolling is so much better than the touch interface for scrolling uh, through and scrubbing through content. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really a winner, and I think that anybody who has the previous Apple TV should get this remote. Yeah, for sure. William, you like the remote? I don't like the Siri button on the side. Um, whichever hand I'm in, I've got to contort it slightly to press it, uh, whereas I preferred it on the other one. But other than that, uh, I like it. I particularly love the mute button now that YouTube is throwing in ever more ads. You just quickly... <laughs> <sighs> It is nice. So bless them for that. Well, I personally like the Siri remote as well. And if you want to hear us talk all about the Siri remote down to the clickiness of the buttons, I encourage you to check out HomeKit Insider. That episode is going to come out Monday. And Andrew and I talk even more about the Apple TV 
and that Siri remote so you can hear all about it there. Tony Mercer on Twitter asked the question if the remote has any kind of way of finding it, if it's lost, like making a beep. And there's no finding feature. Again, this was one of the things that many people were bemoaning is there's no U1 chip. You can't do precision location tracking like with an AirTag. So unfortunately, there is no way to tell the Apple TV to make the remote beep or tell you where it is. Maybe in future versions of the Siri remote, I would love to see a U1 chip where we can actually find where it is. And just to wrap up a couple more things, Mark Williamson sent me an email. I just want to give him a shout out. He was asking about iPad mini rumors. And there's been some iPad mini rumors that maybe it's coming out soon. I'd really be curious what other listeners out there are hoping and looking for the iPad mini to come out. I don't think that's a WWDC device that could be like a press release over the summer or maybe just something in the fall. But we'd love to hear from some of you if you're looking forward to that coming out. So, and again, thanks Mark for that question. And Nick on Twitter was asking me about the iPad Pro and whether or not it's a good upgrade over the 2020 model. If you're a photographer like Austin Mann or you work in the creative field, something where you would really take advantage of that Liquid Retina XDR screen, then it might be a good upgrade. But otherwise, if you're doing more entertainment, just kind of day-to-day tasks, I would hold on a little longer, wait till iPad OS 15 is announced on June 7th at WWDC. Let's see if there's features specifically available just for the M1 iPad Pro, because that might be a reason to upgrade. But as of right now, if there's feature software parity between the 2020 and the 2021 with M1, I would think only if you're in a really creative field where you'll take advantage of the screen, the RAM or the processing, like for photo editing in the field, I would hold off and maybe wait till the next version of the iPad Pro, or at least till we know what iPad OS 15 is like. And you can tweet at us if you have questions or feedback. All of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. You can email me as well. That's in show notes. If you haven't yet, we would appreciate a five-star rating and review in Apple Podcasts. That'll help out the show. And you can support the show at patreon.com slash Apple Insider. You can get an ad-free version of the show plus early access and some bonuses. We post some shortcuts there every once in a while. So check that out, patreon.com slash Apple Insider. And of course, like I mentioned, don't forget to check out HomeKit Insider. That podcast comes out every Monday. I'm talking about HomeKit and smart home stuff. And Apple Insider Daily comes out every day. You get the top Apple news headlines in just a few minutes. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time. 